Hello, everyone. Welcome to the only source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system on the Internet. This is the SoxProspects.com podcast. Thank you for the download of the stream. My name is Chris Hatfield, and I am the executive editor of SoxProspects.com. Coming to you from Sox Prospects Mid-Atlantic here in our nation's capital. Uh, I am joined this week by my partner in crime, our director of scouting, Ian Kundal, and our uh, assistant director of scouting, making his triumphant return to the podcast, Chaz Fiorino. Uh, these two guys were just up in Portland recently for a three-game set. Uh, how was Portland in April, guys? It was really cold. Like, really no, we, cold. <laughs> what? No, the first day was a little cold. We lucked out, though. Saturday, Sunday was actually pretty eh. nice. I'm just thinking, I'm still scarred from that first game. That was really cold. It was like, what, 35 by like the eighth inning? Yeah, it, it wasn't too bad. Saturday and Sunday were Saturday good. Saturday and Sunday I, were good, yeah, though, yeah. You even need a coat. That for April, I'll take that any day. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah, but what, the first day. What yeah. was worse, the first day in Portland or our, the first day that I got down to Fort Myers? Probably the first day in Fort Myers, just because I didn't have any clothes that were wolf for wolf, uh, cold weather when we were down there. I didn't even have a jacket. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> so, enough. yeah, I was, I was well prepared for the... For the uh, weather up in Portland, but yeah, Chaz is right. I guess it's just the first day was bad. This next two, though, it was what was it in like the high forties, probably. No, it was in, yeah, at least uh, high high forties, low fifties. Yeah. Next yeah. two days, so yeah, we made it work. All right. Um, well, I, I, before we get much further, I guess now that we can uh, officially mention this, um, last week, Ian, it was it was just you and me, and uh, this week it's the three of us, and uh, we want to uh, mention and say happy trails to. Uh, Matt Hegel. Matt is uh, moving on from SoxProspects.com. Uh, he has been with the site for years. Uh, he's, he's done some really great work, some, some majors work, and uh, obviously has been a member of the podcast team for a while now. Uh, has been uh, on episodes good and bad, uh, has been on short notice, has been on rescheduled episodes, things like that. Uh, we'll miss him here on the podcast. Um, interesting note, I, I counted the other night because he had his final article for the site went up today from spring training uh, on uh, on Sean Anderson, and it was his 199th byline, which I, I almost wanted to be like, just do some kind of random post just to get you over the hump to 200, but um, a lot of work done by Matt, a lot of good work, so we, want, we appreciate that. Uh, best of luck to Matt in the future. Uh, as far as how the podcast will go, uh, Ian, I think my my thinking, and we're, we're, we're going to kind of see how this goes, but it's going to be probably a base of me and Ian, and we'll bring in a rotating uh, rotating third person, sometimes yes, sometimes no, uh, for some episodes where we do interviews. Uh, we'll probably just do me doing the interview, and if Ian's able to hop on, he will. Uh, but, you know, when we have guests like the Alex Spears and Jim Callises of the world, um, it probably just do maybe more of a one-on-one format for that. Sometimes Ian hopping on, sometimes not. But uh, we're going to continue to bring you um, you know, top-notch coverage. That's our goal, and uh, this will uh, not change that part of things at least. We'll just maybe do it in a little bit different way. So thank you to Matt for his service to the site uh, and as an owner and managing editor of the site, and uh, best of luck to him moving on. Uh, as I mentioned, these guys were just in Portland, so we're going to talk about the Portland Sea Dogs today, and we got a couple of listener emails. If you have an email for the Sox Prospects podcast, send it into pro- podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. Uh, just to get a couple of other bits of business out of the way, um, subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and YouTube. It's the easiest way for you to know when there is a new episode up, and it's uh, how you can best help us uh, get in some new ears. It helps with the algorithms and all that happy stuff. Also, I've been telling you guys for a few weeks about Patreon. Patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. You go on there. You give, you donate a small amount per episode, $1, 2 or $5, and uh, it really helps keep things going. We've had some great response so far. Uh, we're approaching our initial goal of $50 per episode. So um, we also want to give a shout-out to our $5 level contributors. Uh, that would be Sox Signatures, Gerardo Ian Tosca, Kirby Miller, Lendell Martin, who uh, actually sent in an email for this episode, and Cody Pimentel. Thank you to those guys. Thank you to everyone who's giving on on Patreon. Uh, thank you to the Ludlow Thieves for our intro music. Go check them out on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and however you listen. That song is called All the Money, and again, the band name is the Ludlow Thieves. And uh, last but not least, Twitter. Follow the website's account, at Sox Prospects. 
I'm at SP Chris Hatfield. Ian is at uh, give the people your your Twitter handle, Ian. At Ian Cundall, I A N C U N D A L L. And you can follow Chaz at C B Fiorino, C B F I O R I N O. Excellent, excellent. And uh, for those of you who are maybe haven't heard Chaz on here before, Chaz, as I mentioned, is our assistant director of scouting. Uh, also, was uh, saw this morning that uh, Chaz is also going to be doing some work uh, for Baseball Prospectus this season too. So. Uh, great that uh, they brought him in. Smart move on their part. Uh, we'll definitely bring some quality to the table there. So um, Chaz will be doing some great work over there as well as for us. Um, and is 2080 still happening as well, Chaz? Uh, no, I'm moving my other non Red Sox prospect coverage over to Baseball Prospectus. So okay. all that stuff will be over yeah. at BP. Cool. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So um, let's get right into it, gentlemen. Uh, the Portland Sea Dogs. Uh, other than basic, I would I would say other than the second half of last season, have had a rough go of it in terms of rosters in the past few years. They seem to kind of be the level that will sometimes get the shaft a little bit. Um, this year, just I guess, what's your overall take? Uh, starting with you, Ian, uh, as far as the the level there, without really getting too much into this particular guys, unless you want to just quickly name drop a couple. But um, what was your take seeing Portland this year? and the overall talent level there. I think there's more potential major leaguers than there have been in past years, but there's really only one guy who I would consider a a lock right now to be an everyday guy or even project as an everyday guy in Raphael Devers. So it's kind of him. And then there's a pretty, there's a drop off and then there's a bunch of like solid depth guys who you could project, you know, if you, if you want to dream a little bit um, as guys who could, contribute in some role, whether it be in a bullpen role or bench bat or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah. Chaz, does that sound about right to you? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think also too, when you look at the rotation, uh, you know, you start to realize that there's not a lot of depth from a starting pitching standpoint within the system in general, especially when you start getting to Portland. I mean, I don't think there's any guy in there that I'd project as a as a future everyday starter in the big leagues, I think, you know, the, the biggest guy that stands out is Jalen Beeks, uh, who's had some success here early and, and we saw him pitch pretty well and he was pitching pretty well today. I was watching some of the Portland game before we jumped on here and he was pitching well into the third inning and then he kind of got into trouble. But I think, you know, Beeks has a lot of potential, but I think he's more of a reliever probably long term. Um, and I think he could probably even pitch in the big leagues right now as a, as a left-handed, you know, specialist out of the pen, but, you know, kind of, mm-hmm to speak to how they don't really have that much depth. He's probably, Mm -hmm. you know, they're probably trying to develop him as a starter and have him pitching, um, you know, as a starter right now, just as a, as a lack of arms that can even, you know, potentially be starters. So they have him starting in Portland, but, you know, to be honest, he's probably a future reliever down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's, let's get in specific guys. And actually we, we had kind of mentioned that where that's just the system almost in general, especially maybe that that's kind of a bubble in terms of starting pitching because you look in Pawtucket and you've got guys like, Brian Johnson, Henry Owens, Kyle Kendrick, which say what you will about those guys, but, you know, starting-ish at least. And then you go down to Salem and you've got, you know, Roniel Raudes, uh, maybe even a Travis Lakins who, you know, there's a question, but it, it's certainly you could see a starter there. And then in Greenville we've got, you know, the Jay Groom, Sean Anderson, Mike Schwar, and Darwins and Hernandez group. And then even in the, the, the short season you've got a Brian Mata. So – uh, yeah, maybe that is somewhat of a bubble, but I, I want to start with the top guy. Let's rather than burying the lead here. Um, you guys were there for three games. You saw the starters. You saw were Stankowitz, Be- Stankowitz, Beeks, and Ball, I believe. But uh, the guy I want to hear about is Raphael Devers. Um, he's my binky, as everybody knows. Um, he's had kind of a pattern of, you know, last year it was the slow start. In Salem, you know, he's had kind of the half years in Greenville and then in Salem. Um, how did he look come out of the box? Is it an adjustment period maybe like last year, or is he firing on all cylinders, Ian? Uh, yeah, he kind of got off to a hot start. He homered in his first double A at bat because, of course, um, got a 93-mile-per-hour fastball up in the zone and just hit it out to right center field. Pretty easy swing, kind of what he does. Um, just It's very low-key, and then his bat speed and his hands just explode through the ball. And he had a pretty good series. I'm just trying to look back now to um, get everything. Uh, 
situated. But he uh, he had a he had a couple. I think he had a hit in every game. Um, he had the home run. He had a really good. Uh, he had another hit, a double in I think the last this in the Saturday game because he only played the first two games when we were there. That was just a swing Taylor made for Fenway Park. He got a I think it was a two one fastball on the outer half of the plate and just drove it off the wall in left field. Uh, just very easy. He didn't try to pull it because if he tries to pull that ball, he's going to roll it over to second base most likely. So just stayed back and went with it, um, and that was pretty impressive. And yeah, he didn't play the last day, so that was unfortunate. But it, he looked he looked pretty good. Um, it was yeah, kind of stuff we've seen from him before. But it seems like he's taken to the to a little pitching. Obviously, it's a couple games; you can't really take too much. But it seems like he's not phased by the pitching or anything. And um, yeah, he looks ready to go for what could be a pretty promising season that'll put him on the brink of the big leagues yeah yeah and i mean that, that he's at his best when he's going the opposite way like that that's when he got into a little bit of a funk last year was when he was trying to pull everything and was pulling off a little bit but when he's going opposite way like that and the natural power plays um that's when he's he's at his strongest um did you guys did he do anything on defense did he really get any chances i know last year we we heard about the development from kind of maybe questionable, not questionable defense, but uh, kind of the transition to a player who the Red Sox gave their Defensive Player of the Year award to, which is maybe questionable that he would be the best player in the system, but you see why they did it. Um, any, anything on defense from him when you guys were there, the, the two, first two games? Yeah, that's kind of one of the things, too, that I was hoping to see, and he, he didn't really get challenged too much or have anything that he really had to range too much side to side with. Um, he showed a pretty good arm at third on the few plays that he had to make. Um, like Ian said, we only saw him two games, so he didn't have too many opportunities. He did make um, an error. He did make an error. There was one he kind of had, it was, uh, a ball to him kind of straight at him to third and he tried to like take a big kind of scoop at it, which he kind of didn't really even need to do. And he just took like a, a big scoop at it and just kind of bobbled it. Um, it hit the heel and, of his glove and flew yeah, straight up in the air. Yeah. But I would say the other thing I forgot to mention about him at the plate was it, it was interesting. Uh, the first night he hit the home run and I think he had one other hit. And then the second game, they started shifting him. It was three infielders huh. on the right side. And so it took all of one game for them to decide to shift. Even so, though, well, wait, so the home run was pulled? The pull, home run was pulled. He had a couple, I think the, I'm going to, you're going to hear me flipping papers. The double, the, the double was oppo. Yeah, but that was a different game. Um, well, the next it was the day, first, that's what I'm saying, the, the second game. Yeah. The first game, they, he he had a home run to right field. Uh, he had a hard ground ball up the middle where I think the base runner was trying to steal second, so the shortstop was just standing right on the base, and so it ended up being a ground out. And then he had a fly ball to center and a fly ball to left field. But then in the second game, they had three infielders on the right side, except they were playing him to go the other way in the outfield. So okay, I thought that, that was makes pretty sense. interesting. That yeah. makes some sense to, you know, yeah. the— the but power was, to, is to all fields in the outfield, but if it's on the ground, it's probably going to the right side. Yeah, but it was interesting, though, because it seemed like in the on the Saturday game, he was making a concerted effort to go to left field. Like, he had, oh, a couple, um, he had a couple swings that were pretty clearly just trying to poke the ball to left field, like, through the shift, because there was no one on the left side. Well, so thank you, Redding. It's gonna be, it's It's going to be interesting to see if he tries to just, just take cheap singles, basically, just by slapping it to the left side, or if he just stays within himself and just, well, you know, it's rips. Good, it's good practice to get those reps in the minors, frankly, with the way defense in the major leagues is going, I would say. Right? I mean, it's it's not it's not crazy to think that getting practice hitting against the shift is a good thing for him. Oh, no, definitely not. But you, don't, you also don't want to see – you don't want to get out of your approach and just start trying to hit ground balls to the left side. You know, you want to sure. stay within yourself, and if the ball's in the inner half, you want to turn on it. If it's away, go with it. But just don't, like, try to – you know, it can develop some bad habits if you're just trying to put everything to the left side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, right before we jumped on, too, I was watching on MILB TV. I was watching the Portland game, and he, he drove a 1-2 pitch uh, to the left center warning track, bases loaded double, so <laughs> – yeah, I mean the power is definitely to all fields. So that's that's been the thing with him. It's great to see though when he really laces and gets into one, especially when it's going oppo or, or or you know dead center. Um, the other top ten prospect on that roster is Nick Longy, uh, who has only played first base so far. Uh, has not played outfield as we, we'd heard that he might play some more outfield this year, and I was really hoping he would. But I think part of the problem, what I've kind of come to realize over the past few days, is that. Um, Frankly, uh, 
I don't think the team or the organization was planning on having both Bryce Brents and Anuri Tavares back uh, to start the year. Uh, between Brents getting DFA and uh, Tavares being rule f- a Rule 5 pick. And I think they kind of get caught in wanting to stash some depth. So that's why Tavares is in double A. And we'll talk about him in a second. But at the plate, at least, uh, we talked about how long he made some adjustments uh, during the off season that we noticed when we saw him at least taking BP in uh, in the spring tra- in spring training with you know maybe changing the swing path and adding a le- leg lift to the swing. Uh, any payoff on that, Chaz, that you guys saw? Um, I'm trying to look here at my notes of what he did. He didn't really do too much at the plate, but I mean, he was pretty aggressive early in counts. Um, Longy in general, I think he's going to hit. I don't have any questions really about his hit tool. I think he's going to be kind of a line drive hitter, you know, doubles in the gaps type of guy. Um, I think the biggest question with him is if it's going to develop into, to power, you know, over the fence type power. Uh, and then also where he's going to even profile because, you know, if he's going to profile as a first base guy, you know, you question whether he's going to hit for enough power. Uh, and then out in the outfield, you know, he's probably average at best out there in the outfield. And, you know, he doesn't cover too much ground, but he could probably be at least an average guy on the corners. Um, so the biggest question mark with Lonky is kind of where he he profiles. I think he's going to, you know, definitely hit, you know, but like I said, I think he's going to be more of a doubles type, you know, line drive type hitter. He'll hit for average, but I think the biggest question mark with him is where he profiles defensively. And he looked pretty good. He looked okay at first base. Yeah, no, he's a pretty good defender at first, but um, in this, at the plate, as Chaz said, he was pretty aggressive. Uh, I think he only had one hit when we were there. He was two and- for uh, 11 while you guys okay, two, were there. Two for 11, and he just, yeah, it, he was pretty aggressive. He was trying to ta- attack fastballs early in the count. Um, you could see that was like, making a concerted effort. And he, he did drive one, um, I think, in the third game. He got a fastball up that he drove pretty deep to, what was it, left field or left center field. But, yeah, it was nothing. It was small sample, so can't take too much away. Right. I mean, at this point in the season, we should probably mention uh, Devers, Entering today was hitting 333, 333, 571 uh, with that one home run. Uh, Longy entered today hitting 263, 300, 263. So no extra base hits on the season yet. But of course, early, you know, it's it's April in the in the Northeast. So, you know, the power tends to come later in the year as it warms up. But still, uh, did you did you notice Ian, especially because you had seen him in extended spring training, uh, you know, you can concentrate all you want on a on a change in batting practice. Are the mechanical adjustments translating in the game, at least in the fact that he's carrying through on them? Yeah, it's the same. He's got the the more elevated in the swing path, and then the leg leg kick. Um, he was doing it, yeah, every at bat. So yeah, he's carried that through, and maybe there'll be some struggles early. I mean, as you said, there there is definitely a difference to facing game pitching versus when you're you know taking BP or when you're even facing spring training pitching. Mm-hmm. So could be a little bit of an adjustment period for him, but I think he'll be fine in the long run. Mm-hmm. Um, the hottest hitter in the Portland lineup, uh, pre- arguably, I guess you could. You could there's might be one other guy who has a claim to it, but especially if you go back to what he did in Portland in the second half of last season, it's kind of crazy to me that Anuri Tavares is still in Portland after being returned from uh, from the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, was a Rule Five pick, came back, and in six games, uh, he's ten for twenty six with a home run and a double, uh, three steals in four attempts. Uh, he's hitting three eighty five, four twenty nine, five thirty eight. Uh, I'm kind of surprised we didn't get any questions about him, but I think we might have last time. Uh, what did you guys see out of Tavares during this? When he was he's leading off, and he was uh, he he had a home run in the first game as well, and he uh, had six hits while you guys were there. So, what did you see out of Anuri Tavares? Ian, he was impressive. He he was. I'm trying to separate basically offensively he was impressive defensively it's where we're going to get into the issues but offensively yeah he he showed an all fields approach um he had he was just basically taking what the pitcher was getting was giving him and just he would go to left field if he had to he went to center field home run was to right field um he turned on a fastball it's like 89 though it wasn't it was more less bp fastball but um he actually walked which was kind of surprising because that's something his approach has uh been problematic in the past like you go back to 2015 when he was in portland he had eight walks and 234 bats and struck out 64 times um but it improved a little bit last year but uh he he's getting 
aggressive too at the same time. He's kind of he seems to get have a better uh, understanding of the strike zone now as he's matured and he's uh, kind of laying off those pitches out of the zone and uh, making more contact, especially early in the count. So that's good. And I think he can hit. I mean, I think he's definitely someone who can, he's going to be able to hit major league pitching. I just have questions about number one, how much power he's going to end up with. I don't think it's like a corner outfield profile power wise. And that's the other thing is he still isn't playing center field. Um, they, he didn't play center in any of the games when we were there. He's playing corner outfield only. He didn't play any center field last year, really. And a guy with you know below average power and profiles in a bench role has to be able to play center field, and I'm not, and he can't. So that's and it's it's interesting because when you hear the description of the player, it seems like a player who should be able to play center, but he hasn't played center yet. He's he's played right field twice and left field three times entering today. Yeah, and it's not like, you know, when he was in the outfield, I don't think he got a lot of opportunities, but he's like probably a 55-60 runner. Like, he looks like he's somewhat, and he's undersized. He's probably like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, so he has the physical profile and, like, the traits, or at least speed-wise, that you'd expect in a center fielder, but just for whatever reason, I don't, whether it's he doesn't have the instincts for the position or isn't comfortable out there with his roots or reads or whatever, they just they aren't even trying to play him there. So, yeah, it's it's a strange one because you just don't see many bench outfield profile bench outfielders who can't play center field, let alone ones who okay, okay. maybe you can't play center field, but you, you at least can hit like thirty home runs or crush it, left handed. That's pitching. what I was about to say. Is what I was about to say is that at least there's a you know there's something else that's there at the plate that justifies you not playing center. But yeah, he's a, I mean he's a left handed hitter, so he's you know and he's not someone I don't think it's an, enough bats profile as an everyday guy, so he's not going to be on like the strong side of a platoon, so. It, it's a strange one. Um, I'm really. I well, wish the they would just. Left-handed bat, he would, right? Well, no, I'm saying he would be on the strong side oh, of the platoon, oh, oh, but gotcha. I don't think he has yeah. enough bat to be an everyday guy on the strong side of a platoon. Is what I'm saying. I think gotcha. it's like a bench profile. Gotcha. And I, I, I would. I kind of hope they just start throwing him in center field. Like we need to. I don't. I don't. It mean if it hasn't. I don't think he played any last there last year at all. But I don't know really what they have to lose by trying him there. Because what's the worst that happens? I mean, I guess if he's a butcher out there, that's fine. He goes back to doing what he's doing now. He plays the corners. But if he can play center field, I mean, both internally with the, with the team and then in trade value will go up if he's able to play center. So we'll see if that's something they decide to do in a couple weeks. Yeah, in his career in the minors, he has played 63 games uh, in center field. Uh, I mean, you can't really tell much on fielding percentage with outfielders. It's consistent. Um, with the rest of his uh, time in the minors. Uh, looking at last year in Portland, he didn't play center field at all. Uh, in 2015 in Portland, he got 11 games out there, uh, 36 in right, 19 in left. Uh, and before that in Salem, he got three games in center, 12 in left, 22 in right. So, um, yeah, he, he, he didn't hasn't played center field really since 2015, and even then he was playing the corners more. So... It's it's a weird profile, and then and the, and the, the stolen base thing too. He, you read about how much speed he has, but his stolen base percentages really haven't. Uh, I mean, if you look last year in Portland, he uh, let's see, he had a forty four percent stolen base rate. If I'm reading that, yeah, uh, no, that's definitely not right. Why, why does that say forty four percent? Oh, that's twenty fifteen. Yeah, twenty sixteen last year. Yeah, he had a sixty two percent stolen base rate, uh, and seventy five percent is break even. So, you know, for a guy who has a bunch of speed, he hasn't really been able to steal bags at the double-A level this year, like I said, three for four. So that's right at the break-even point. Um, you'd like to see that maybe uptick a little bit too. Um, I guess just to kind of wrap up with Portland, uh, anybody, anybody else really stick out to you guys that you saw? I mean, looking at the box scores, uh, you know, it, frankly, it's it's some intriguing guys. No, one, no performances really stick out going through a quick beyond Tavares. Uh, anyone come to mind for you, Chaz, on the in the lineup side that seemed interesting? Uh, and Danny Mars is a little bit of an interesting guy, switch hitter with speed, undersized guy who can, you know, kind of probably play all three outfield positions. He's athletic, but he's more of just kind of like a contact oriented guy. Um, you know, he's up there slapping from the from the left side, but he's a pretty good contact oriented hitter. And um, you know, he came up on the right side and actually homered over the uh makeshift green monster out there in portland so that was kind of some you know surprising pop to see from the right side but 
Um, you know, he's a guy who, you know, kind of similar to Tavares, he's a contact oriented guy, switch hitter, um, can play the outfield, got some speed, but you know, he's, you know, undersized, not going to hit for much power. Um, but he, he was kind of a guy that just was kind of worth watching. Mm-hmm. Ian, anybody come to mind for you? I know I've got one more guy I do want to ask about, or maybe one or two more guys that I do want to ask about, but does anybody come to mind for you that stood out over the set? Uh, I wouldn't say stood out. I would say like Jordan Procession. Yeah, that's what he, I was going to ask he, about. He had, a, he had a home run and he had a couple of singles, but it's like a it's not an everyday catcher profile. It's more an up and down catcher profile, I would say at best. So, you know, it's a good player to have in your system, but nothing really too sexy there. Um, how about receiving? It, I mean, how did he look? I mean, I, I can't tell. Let's. I, I'll look up the stolen base numbers, but. It was, I mean, it, they didn't, I don't think he caught Cozart, which was the one probably we'll get onto where things kind of got out of hand. But um, yeah, I mean, he was fine back there. Um, yeah, I don't he, think he's he a standout. Cozart. Oh, he did catch Cozart? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was an adventure. But um, yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing really stood out there. Um, I was, we were more paying attention to the pitcher since it was the first look, so I didn't really hone in on the catcher. Yeah, the only stolen um, base attempt was a yeah. successful one against Jake DePew, so. Yeah. And then the other guy I would say is just more like in an organizational capacity. Cole Sturgeon did some stuff. Um, he was playing, I think he played center right and left across the three games and showed off a pretty good arm in the outfield. And, you know, he just oh, no. got on base. You know, he had a couple hits in each game or one hit in the first game, two in the second game, and then one in the third or two in the third game. So I think, you know, he's not someone who I don't think, I think is, you know, a significant prospect or anything, but he's a good depth guy and um, someone who will be pretty valuable on that team, I think, throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I play, and he was hitting third in the lineup as well. Um, he actually didn't play center. He played left and right, but um, he has played center for them. So, um, yeah. Also, by the way, Sturgeon, an endangered fish. It's endangered, actually, didn't it? <laughs> And I know that because I ate it once and came home to find out that it was endangered and felt terrible. But oh well. wow, I'm a bad person. What can I tell you? Um, all right, well, th- that's that's. I like that wrap up, guys. Let's move over to the pitching side, uh, and I guess maybe to start, let's start with the starters, which would make all the sense in the world. Uh, you saw Teddy Stankwitz, Jalen Beeks, and Trey Ball. Um, let me go with uh, Ian for Stankowitz, um, and then I want to hear – Chaz already started going on Beaks. But uh, what did we see out of Stankowitz in game one? Uh, just to read the line, in that game he went six innings, four hits, two runs, both earned, two walks and two strikeouts. Uh, he needed only 73 pitches to get through the six innings. Yeah, I, I think the line was pretty a fair reflection of his game in that he's, his big issue is he just doesn't miss bats. Um, there's no real – pitch I would grade at anything better than average and maybe there are more all like 45 pitches um his fastball is mostly 90 to 92 we topped out at 94 I think once but it was pretty much all 90 92 he'd mix in his curveball 77 to 79 but it was inconsistent he wasn't snapping it off and it got kind of slurvy and loose at times he also mixed in a slider um 83 to 85 that was kind of cutter like it was short and um horizontal break and that was the pitch he kind of seemed to find later in his outing. He got a couple swing and misses against that. Um, and then a change up like 84, 85, not a lot going on with that. So it's his problem is I don't, I don't think he profiles in the bullpen role. Um, the the stuff isn't going to play up. Stankowitz, yeah. yeah. The stuff doesn't play up in a bullpen role. And as a starter, there's really, you know, he doesn't have any pitch that even could. I think is a put away pitch at the double A level, let alone at the triple A or big league level. So I kind of think he's going to establish himself as again, a solid organizational guy, but I'm just, I, I don't see much upside. And I think, yeah, that's kind of what, what he did that game is what you're going to get. You know, he'll, he'll keep you in games for six innings, but not, you know, you're not going to get a lot more than that. Yeah. Just to go ahead and read. He had, he had made a second start on, uh, he made a second start yesterday and like you said, it was seven innings, eight hits, three runs, two earned, no walks, five strikeouts. So the increase in the strikeouts, but you know, eight hits in seven innings uh, to get through the seven innings uh, needed ninety-one pitches, which is good. But again, it's it's a line that doesn't jump off the page at you necessarily. So, um, all right, well, uh, Chaz, let's get your take on Jalen Beeks. You already gave us kind of the start on it. Uh, his line was outstanding: five innings, two hits. Uh, no runs, two two walks, eight Ks uh, from the left-hander out of Arkansas. Uh, 
you got us started, but you see him as a reliever down the line. What the stuff look like? Yeah, Beeks was definitely the most interesting guy, the starters that we saw. Um, he came out early throwing, you know, 93, 94, touch 95 from the left side. Um, he's kind of got some deception in his delivery. He kind of rocks back and kind of turns his back a little bit, and he's got kind of like a hook in the back with his arm and hides the ball well. He's tough to pick up, and he's coming out from the first base side of the rubber. Uh, and when he and I were watching, we were talking about he kind of he looked like he was more a little bit more online towards the plate than we had seen him in the past. And then we kind of went back and looked at video from spring training of last year. And he looks like he's a little bit more online and he doesn't kind of turn his back and rock as much as he used to. But there's still some deception in the delivery um, and he's more online towards the plate. But, you know, from the left side, from the first base side of the rubber, that's a really uncomfortable at bat for left handed hitters. Um, and you know, he's an undersized guy. He's like 5'10, 5'11, 180. Um, so in terms of kind of like the body and the size, he kind of profiles best as a reliever. And like I said, he came out throwing 94, 95. Um, and then kind of as the, the game went on, he kind of settled it in more towards like 90, 91. Um, but he threw fastball, cutter, uh, was like 87, 88, uh, curveball 74 to 76, and then a pretty good change up 84 to 86. Uh, he was 14 for 20 on first pitch strike. So that's, you know, 70%. That's pretty good. Uh, and then he had 16 swing and misses and he, he was 54 of 81 pitches for strikes. So 66%. He threw strikes. He worked really quick as well, which was good to see. Um, he had a really good pace and, you know, he got the ball, got on the mound and just threw and kind of kept guys um, on their feet. But he he pitched really well and, um, you know, he's a guy that you, you, you look at him and you look at the deception and the delivery and the stuff. And, you know, he's a guy that could probably pitch in the big leagues right now out of the pen as a left-handed specialist. I mean, just looking at his stuff and like we were, we were talking about, it, I was like, he has better stuff than Abad and Robbie Ross. And, um, you know, those guys, he, he just, he has better stuff. And I think he's probably, you know, he has pretty good stuff and they have him pitching out of the starting rotation, but I think that's more because they just don't have the arms to even fill a starting rotation down in double A in the lower levels. But he's a guy, if you wanted to accelerate him and throw him in the pen, I think he's a guy that can move quickly. Well, something we and talked I'll, about last week, just if I can interrupt, is that there's almost too many relievers between double right. A and triple A as well. So you well, might as well with, start him. And with how structured they are with their bullpen usage, you know, the guys go usually to two innings or one inning. Um, they usually only have two relievers scheduled for each game. You just don't have enough innings for relievers. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. even if we, we went to a three game series and we saw what we saw all but one of the relievers. And then he threw the next day, as you predicted, I think on the board, yeah, I was about to could, say that you could, you could tell, cause we had a poster in our forum who was, who thought it was significant that Ty Buttry got the ball in a tight game on opening day. And as the setup guy, and I had to kind of explain, well, no, he was getting the ball first after the starting pitcher, no matter what the score was, pretty much. Uh, and that's how it works, because you could see the rotation. And then, you know, on the fourth game, Josh Smith was the only guy who didn't pitch yet. So he went in first, and then Buttry came in, because uh, he yeah, was and the next guy up. So it's very structured at double-A. Well, that's it was interesting, because the Phillies team, the Reading team they were playing, was using guys for one inning, and they were, you know, running out three or four relievers in each game. And then you have the Red Sox where, you know, except for one game where Trey Ball got knocked out a little early, um, they were, you know, it was one inning and out for the relievers. Or, sorry, it was uh, two innings at least. And except when they had, like, Austin Maddox, I think the first game only threw an inning because they only There's only one inning. inning. There's only an inning but, left, yeah. Yeah. So it's just interesting how different teams do it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, yeah, the, I should mention Beaks. Pitch tonight went, uh, as, as Chaz kind of alluded to, went three and two-thirds uh, before coming out. It was, it's an interesting line. It's three and two-thirds, four hits, five runs, all earned on uh, three walks and seven strikeouts. Basically, like like Chaz says, cruised through the first three innings, uh, only gave up a, a double and a walk, uh, struck out the side in the third inning, uh, and then in the fourth inning, uh, single on a ground ball to third baseman, Raphael Devers, wild pitch, strikeout, uh, pass ball, walk, triple by Billy McKinney, uh, a walk, uh, RBI ground out, and then a home run that chased him. So he just looked like kind of got dinked and dunked a little bit, but you said he also looked like he was tiring, Chaz. Yeah, I mean, he like I said, he was dealing through the first three innings. He had six Ks and um, 
you know, it's tough to watch on the, the, the grainy MILB TV, but right. um, his stuff looked pretty good early. And, you know, you just, you look at the body, you look at the delivery, you look at the arm action, it just screams reliever. Um, and then especially like we, we, like I said, in the first inning, when Ian and I saw him, he was 93 to 95. Um, and then he kind of, you know, in the, the later innings, he kind of started to sit more in the low nineties, but he's a guy, if you can just, you know, throw him out there for an inning, let him sit 94, 95. And, um, you know, from the left side, he's a, he's a pretty good reliever option. I think mm-hmm. to, to down the road, he's a guy that can move quickly if you just throw him in the pen. Mm-hmm. Good stuff on, on Jalen Beeks there. And one more note on, uh, the Portland lineup tonight, I should mention after, uh, something that contradicts what I said earlier, Nick Longy is playing left field tonight. So. Uh, good to see them starting to get him some run out there. Maybe he'll play it more when I, I, they get Tavares to, to AAA. Go ahead. Ian. Well, I think it's that. And it, right now their outfield is just, it's pretty full. Um, right. With Tavares, Monhi, Mars, and Cole Sturgeon, that's four guys you could be having playing every day in the outfield. So. And you could argue that I, my, my conspiracy theory is that Mike Myers, who was in Salem, got pushed down from Portland because of the fact that both Brents and Tavares came back. Uh, as I said on here before, so well, I think too. Also, it probably didn't help that Salem has had uh, Tate Matheny started the season on the DL there too. Uh, so. no, I don't think he started the season on the DL. He he got hurt. Him and him and Washington, Kyrie Washington, Did he? both started. Yeah, him and Kyrie Washington both oh, started. Oh, you're right. He got healthy. hurt in the first game of the year. Yeah, they both yeah, got hurt, hurt in the first game. Of the year, right? They both did. So they had to call up Chris Madera from Greenville. Um, and they you're just, right. Disregard that. Down. But it's fine. It's okay. We still love you. Um, <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, and then the last starter, and I, probably the one that most people want to know about, uh, Trey Ball started the third game. Uh, five and a third, seven hits, four runs, two walks, six Ks. Is there anything there, Ian? It's a tough one again. Chaz and I were talking about it, and if Trey Ball was 18 still, it would be awesome. Mm-hmm. And I would think of him as like an early first-round pick like he was. But it just seems like his stuff just hasn't improved at all since he signed. He was 88 to 91 mostly. I mean, I think he touched 93 once. And then other than that, it was, you know, 90, 89, 91, 89, 88, 90. And so the velocity just hasn't really taken a tick up. The fastball straight doesn't have a lot of life. Um, the delivery... Um, it wasn't. He had some trouble with it. He wasn't finishing. He doesn't really have any fastball command right now. And the secondary stuff, there was just nothing really that stood out. Um, he showed off a change it up, a curveball, and then a cutter and a slider. And the cutter and the slider would run into each other too much. Um, you know, the cutter was more like 84 to 87. The slider was 81 to 84. And so sometimes, you know, when it was in that 83, 84, 85 range, you couldn't tell which one it was. And it was just kind of this loose, you know, offering that didn't do a lot. Um, his curveball, which I think was a signature pitch coming out of high school, he barely threw. It was more of like he'd use it early in counts to try and steal a strike, kind of like Henry Owens does. And his changeup, too, he didn't throw it a lot. Um, it was mostly to get swing and misses. It was mostly on the cutter or the slider. And he did. He got two, four, six. He got nine swing and misses over the five-plus innings but and a few strikeouts. But he just he struggled with his control. He had a couple walks. Um, he gave up some loud contact, you know, when he was in the zone and, you know, the delivery is good. The body and the the frame is good. He looks like, you know, a really promising pitching prospect, but then it's just the stuff just doesn't match and hasn't improved. So yeah, it was, um, wasn't great. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, is, is it there for him to move to the bullpen? I know we talked last time or, or one of the previous episodes about move him to the bullpen versus move him to the outfield. Is it there to move him to the bullpen, or is it just? I'm not I mean, sure. With, with Trey Ball, it's it's. I'm not sure because, you know, if you're, I mean, I guess he's a lefty, which gives him a better chance of moving to the pen. But if the velo is going to be, you know, 89 to 91 out of the bullpen, that's not really going to play. Um, you know, it plays for Robbie Scott because he's thrown from that weird arm slot, but. For what he is, you know, he's got that three quarters delivery and he's got, you know, really efficient, good delivery. It's just, you know, once he gets going, it's just the arm, what what comes out of his arm basically just doesn't match the rest. So I'm not sure. And again, with the secondaries, uh, Chaz, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I wouldn't put any of them above an average grade pitch. No, yeah, no, I I absolutely agree. So, you know, he looks looks like he, and this was actually. This was honestly the first time that I've even seen Ball since he's been in the system. But like everything that you have read about and hear about with Ball, like 
he is literally the guy, it sounds like the guy that he was when they drafted him. Like, you look at him, he's like 6'6", six, six, he's like 180, like soaking wet, like skinny guy. He looks like he's projectable, like he could put on, you know, some muscle and some weight. And, um, you know, the delivery's fine. It's pretty clean delivery. And, he, you know, he shows four or five pitches from the left side. And, you know, he just looks like a guy that just screams, like, projection. But he's literally the same guy that, that they drafted, like, five years ago. So, um, you know, that's kind of frustrating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, well, let's do this before we get into the bullpen, guys, because it's it's a deep bullpen there, and we don't really have time to go through every single pitcher in that bullpen. Uh, I, I, I want to put you guys on the spot a little bit here. In that, the, so the the Portland pitching staff has the three starters we mentioned: uh, Jacob Dahlstrand and Kevin McAvoy round out the rotation. Uh, the bullpen is Luis Isla, Jake Cosart, Jamie Callahan, Williams, Harris, Ty Buttry. Uh, you guys saw Austin Maddox. He has already been promoted to Pawtucket, uh, which made me think that Fernando Abad was getting designated for assignment today rather than Ben Taylor getting optioned. But we'll get to Taylor in a minute. Um, Josh Smith and Taylor Grover. You did not see Josh Smith, and I don't think you saw Grover either because uh, I think he was on the Phantom DL. No, we, 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 we saw Grover. Grover. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, all right, well, I guess you did see him. Uh, at any rate, uh, what I'm just curious about, you can pick – three of those pitchers to have in your organization, who are you going to pick? Um, and since you, uh, Chaz, are the um, the less frequent guest on the podcast, we'll be gracious and allow you first take at what three pitchers from, from the pitching staff in Portland would you take in the, your organization? The relievers? No, just any of the uh, five plus Of seven. any of the people we saw, who would you take? Yeah, any uh, of the people you saw. I'd take, give me Beaks. Um, Buttry. Wait, you said three? Yep. All right, we'll go Beaks, Isla, hmm. Buttry. All right, Ian, how about you? Even though I we didn't go, see, we did not see good Isla, but still, I would take Beaks, Isla, and Callahan. All right. Interesting. No Jake Cosart in there. But. <laughs> yeah, well, that was. Should we talk about that? It was bad. Okay, yeah. Was, so, well, and the thing is, he had his second outing, and it wasn't that much better. So, we we have to determine whether there's no. I mean, he, I think he 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 only walked like four and two. He got through two innings that time, at least. <laughs> Fair, okay. <laughs> I mean, he didn't get it. He didn't get an out in this inning. He he got he, he, got, he pitched. A, no, he didn't though, because it was a sacrifice bunt. Like they oh. gave him an out. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. So his line, you, you guys saw him on uh, the third game. Uh, he pitched one third of an inning, did not allow a hit, gave up two runs, both earned on four walks, no strikeouts. He and he threw, hit a guy. He threw twenty, and he hit a guy. Twenty? No, he did. Yeah, he did. Okay, yes, twenty-five did. pitches, eight strikes. What happened with Cozart? I mean, it. I've seen it before. He did it when I was when I saw him in Lowell a few times. And it, Every time just, I've seen him, yeah. Yeah, it's just sometimes he just doesn't have it. He could just can't throw a strike, and you can tell pretty early. Um, I think I, I didn't think of this until after the fact, but when we when he was warming up, a ball ended up in the outfield, and uh, the, sale, the 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 Portland bullpens are elevated and probably like fifteen feet from the field. So for a ball to skip off the ground, most likely, and deflect off the catcher and end up in the outfield is impressive, <laughs> and that probably was a sign of bad things because I mean, when he was in Lowell, they had to put up like a they had to basically screen. have a net behind yeah. the catcher. A screen yeah. behind the catcher when he was war- when it wasn't just him, but when he was warming up, especially to because the ball was coming into the field to play too often. But it just, I mean, his delivery is just so rough. It's he doesn't use his lower half at all. It's all just arm strength. And I mean, I think Chaz, you'll agree, it's one of the quickest arms I've ever seen. But yeah, he probably has, he easily has probably the quickest arm in the system. But he just like it's all relying on that. And when he doesn't have it, you know, he has no idea where the ball's going. He's not even looking at the plate when he releases, he's got this huge head whack so that he's looking off at first base when he throws the ball. So, you know, there's no command at all. And there's in this outing, he just didn't have any control. He just couldn't throw strikes. And, you know, when you can't throw strikes, you can't, you know, you're not going to succeed it obviously. And, um, it was more noteworthy. I think that his stuff was down. He was only like 92, 94, and when he's at his best, like when I saw him last year in uh, Greenville, when he had a really good out, I think he had like seven Ks in three innings or something, or six Ks in two innings. He was sitting like 95, 97. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty significant drop down to 92, 94. And 
it was just, you know, it's one of those days. Um, that's going to be the problem with him. I think pretty much his entire career is he's just sometimes going to get the yips and just not be able to throw a strike. And, you know, it was one of those outings. And it seems like he, he was able to at least, excuse me, at least get through two innings in his second outing. And I think he had like three walks, though, still. Yes, uh, three walks, but, four strikeouts. Yeah, so it's, I mean, when the stuff is on, it's premium stuff, but it's just the command profile is really rough and the delivery is so bad that I think it's, you know, the injury risk is very high. So, you know, he's he's someone who, if you see him good, you might like him a little bit, but if you see him bad, then, yeah, you're you're just, you will NP him pretty much immediately. Yeah, I just, I just sent you guys a link to a photo on Kelly O'Connor's website uh, from this past, from Portland. And he's literally got his eyes closed as he's throwing the baseball. Yeah, that's not surprising. The, the, he, he's cocked, ready to throw. Um, you know, the elbow is up, and he's about to deliver, and his eyes are complete, like slammed shut. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's they're they're wearing that awful hat with the enormous slugger logo. Oh, it's it? terrible. It, so was the, that the game you guys saw? I presume well, they they wore that the Sunday game. I think. Yeah, that's the one. He, the he Saturday wore. game they wore the good one though, which is the one the with main the main. One. Yeah. The state of Maine, like that's a good hat. I like that one. Okay. But yeah, that, that the Sunday hat's bad. I, I mentioned that just to see if this is the game you guys saw. But um, yeah, oh yeah, April 9th. Yeah, so this is the game you guys saw. And he, like I said, he's literally got his eyes closed. It. It's funny if you look back. There's another photo on there from 2015 in spring training, and he's got his right eye closed and his left eye squinting as he, well, as he the, throws. The interesting thing is the last time this happened, which was in Lowell, and what was that, 2014 or 2015? I can't remember. Um, it was because they were trying to tinker with his delivery and basically get him to start incorporating his lower half, and he just didn't take to that at all and couldn't throw strikes, and eventually they shut it down, and they let him go back to his old delivery last year, and that's when he had the success, you know, when he kind of cruised through Greenville and even was pretty impressive in Salem to end the year, though he still walked a lot of guys. And this year, it seems he's still back with his old delivery. So I'm just, I, I don't know what happened that day. It might have been jitters, you know, first double A appearance, which pretty aggressive assignment to double A too. He only got what, like 17, 18 innings in uh, high A last year. So that's yeah, a pretty he significant just, he jump. Just shoved, that was the problem. I mean, he, he yeah, I mean, he had challenged. 11 walks in 18 innings, though. He did, he still. did, but he also struck out 28 guys. Yeah, so. so it's yeah. And the other thing that that I was a little concerned with was the secondary pitches did not look anything like they were in his past when he's good either. Um, his curveball was what was it like 77 to 80, just this loose, just nothing there. And then he threw one change up at 80 which he just didn't have any feel for. And it wasn't like the sharp overhand curveball that you'll see when he's on. So I think it was just, yeah, I'm hoping it was just one of those outings, but we'll, we'll have to see, you know, going forward if it's becomes the norm or if it was more of an aberration. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see if Cozart's able to kind of straighten the ship a little bit. Um, I, I mentioned our reader listener emails, and we got one from our uh, patron, Lendell Martin, and he asked, uh, wondering how Jamie Callahan's strong start in spring in the early season has affected your opinion on him. He really impressed me in the spring games I saw. Seemed like he's closer to the majors than I thought with how long he hung around MLB camp. Could he be an option later this summer, or is next season more likely? Uh, You guys saw Callahan on that Sunday as well. He came in and finished off uh, after Cosart. He came in and uh, did a lot better which I guess kind of goes without saying, but uh, I'm trying to bring up the, the play-by-play here. For this I got game. it. He, he entered with bases loaded, um, yeah. one out, mm-hmm. and he got out of that inning in three pitches and then had a one, two, three, ninth with two strikeouts. So, so yeah. yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, what do you guys see from Callahan? Uh, is there something there? Is there something to what kept him in, in big league camp for as long as he was up there? Or, you know, what, what's the situation there? And can he contribute this year, or are we looking more at next year? Maybe Chaz, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I think Ian likes him a little bit more than I do, but he's, I mean, he's got some size. He's like 6'4", 225, and he throws kind of straight over the top. So he's got yeah. s- kind of some deception um, and some, like, really good downhill playing because he's literally coming, like, straight over the top. And, um, you know, his velo was pretty good. He was 93 to 94. Um, through a change up and a slider, which were kind of ran into each other. They were both kind of 85 to 87. Um, he blew some fastballs by guys. He, I think he had about, you know, five or six swing and misses on his fastball. Um, and he threw strikes for the most part. So he was pretty good. That was the best that I had seen him. 
Um, and you know, he, like I said, he's, he's got some deception. He's straight over the top and he's a big guy. Um, but I think, I, I don't know. He's not, I'm not too high on him. Um, but he's, he's kind of, he's a really good org reliever in, in my opinion. Um, I know some guys are a lot higher on him than I am. Ian Callahan, what's your take? Yeah, I just, I think that, that what separates uh, him for me than some of the other guys, I think there's a little better command profile with him. Um, he hasn't shown it in the past, but I liked the way his delivery looked yesterday or not yesterday, uh, on Sunday. And as Chad said, you know, the fastball has got some life. And I think the big thing for him is he can, his fastball is going to miss bats. Um, it's like 93, 95. He gets good extension from his frame coming directly over the top. So he's releasing it much closer to the plate than some guys, for example, Cozart, who has no extension. And um, the secondary pitches, as Chaz alluded to, they did run into each other a little bit. And there wasn't a lot of movement on that. Um, they didn't do a lot either. I wouldn't grade any of them above, you know, maybe average at best. But um, the fastball alone is something that I think could carry him a little bit. And I was kind of looking at it from the fact that I had kind of written him off, I'll admit it, as a starter. Um, you know, some, when I had seen him a lot when he was with Lowell and then Greenville the last couple of years prior to last year. And when he was just, there was just not a lot there, but I, I just, I think the bullpen role plays well for what he's doing right now. And, um, if he can get one of those secondary pitches, uh, you know, improve a little bit, get a little more consistency with it, then I think he has the fastball and the, and he'd have the two pitch mix that potentially could profile in like a sixth inning role. Um, all right. Well, I guess we've we've mentioned two other relievers. We may as well get to them. Uh, we'll go maybe lightning round, hopefully, because uh, I'd like to kind of wrap this up. But uh, I guess we'll go Chaz Luis Isla. Um, he's a guy you guys both mentioned as someone you would take out of this out of this staff, even though you know was one of the first guys optioned down out of major league camp when guys like Callahan, Austin Maddox, Ben Taylor, Chandler Shepard stuck around far far longer. Edgar Olmos. Uh, you know, was optioned down to down to Portland, even though he was first option to Pawtucket, which is merely procedural. It doesn't really mean anything. But um, what do you guys see there, and what did you see this weekend versus what you think you see there in the future? Yeah, we we didn't see good Isla this time around. We Ian and I were both at the same game last summer, and we saw Isla, and he came out throwing like ninety five to ninety seven from the left side. Um, but he, he, he threw a ton of kind of off his, his off speed stuff. He was throwing his change ups and his sliders. He threw a lot of change ups. This was last summer I'm talking about. Um, and we're like, what the hell is he doing? He's throwing like 97 from the left side, but I think he was just kind of working on his off speed, um, you know, last year, but you know, we came away super impressed last year. And then, so we were excited to see him this year. Uh, and then we caught him. I think we saw him for two innings. He had two hits, a walk, two strikeouts and an earned run. But, um, you know, his velo was down. He, he topped at 94, but he was more kind of 91 to 93. Um, didn't really have good command. And then he, he his change-up and slider were kind of below average. Um, change-up was like 85 to 86, and the slider was around 78 to 82. But um, he just didn't have as good a stuff and polish as, as we saw last summer. Uh, and the velo was down a little bit. But he's another guy that kind of he, – he's a left-hander, throws from the first base side of the rubber. So he's a really tough at bat for lefties. Uh, but the stuff was definitely down compared to what we had saw last year. Mm-hmm. And anything to be worried about there? You think, Ian, or no? No, I, I think it was just early season. Um, he looked a little bit. Uh, the body didn't look the same as it did last year. I'll just say that. Um, looked like he may have be a little bit uh, gain some weight. So maybe he just has to work that off and get the delivery down because he has a lot of moving parts in his delivery. He's got a long arm action. It's very jerky. Just you know, limbs flailing all over the place. So it's going to be something that's tough to repeat in, um, for more than an inning or so. And um, when it's off, you know, it's going to be off. And he's going to have some command issues, as Chaz alluded to. And that was, that was just one of these days. So, you know, I'll, I'm hope, hopefully we'll get to see him again in a couple of weeks. And um, we'll see if that was, you know, more just a one-time thing or if that's kind of what he is now the below is down and mm-hmm. the secondary stuff's kind of taking a tick back mm-hmm. and then uh chaz i guess i'll go back to you because you mentioned ty butchery um what you guys see there i should mention isla's line two innings two hits uh one run earned uh one walk two strikeouts uh and the, the second game you guys saw uh butchery in the first game came in two innings one hit no uh, no runs one walk three k's uh what'd you see out of butchery and is he taken at the bullpen roll so this was the second time I saw Buttry. I saw him last year, and I did not like him at all. He had absolutely no command. 
Um, the secondary stuff was terrible. I just, I came away, just didn't like him at all. Uh, and then he came out today and, or when we saw him over the weekend and, you know, he was, he topped 96, he was 93 to 95 mostly. Um, he didn't have any command again, but he, you know, he at least had really good life on the fastball. He, I think he had, he went, uh, he, he balked twice, walked a guy and hit a guy. All right. So that kind of just <laughs> speaks to kind of the command that he had. But the fastball velo was there. He had good life on the fastball. And then he had a really good splitter. Um, there was a change up or a splitter. It was a, uh, 82 or 79 to 82. Um, and it had really good like split-like tumble down in the zone. Um, it was probably the best secondary pitch that we saw out of the bullpen. Uh, Austin Maddox had a pretty good change up too, but... Um, in terms of secondary stuff that we saw out of the Portland bullpen, for me at least anyway, I think Ty Buttrey's um, splitter was the best secondary pitch that we saw. But like I said, he just has absolutely no command and no control. He doesn't know where it's going. Um, but he's a big dude. He's like 6'6", 230. So, um, you know, he kind of is coming downhill at you. He's a huge dude. And, um, you know, he's got some velo. So um, if he can kind of work on his command, then, you know, maybe there's something there. But Right now, he just—he's another guy that has no idea where it's going. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. He's a guy you've seen for a long time too, Ian. What, yeah, what I mean think? the the, the changeup is. It, I, I I was looking online and did some research, and it, it, he calls it a changeup, um, or at least he did in an article I read last year about it. But um, it it was definitely as Chad said, it was probably the best secondary pitch we saw, and that's really something that's going to serve him well because in the past, you know, he used to have that big spike curveball, but he seems to have completely scratched that and the slider. He didn't throw it all either. So it's just fastball change. Up. Well, the spike curveball, he, I think he's, he scratched, he got rid of that in Salem. Cause I remember yeah, when he got I, it in 2015, when you're I, right. When I talked to him, he's, he, I talked to him while he was scrapping it for a more traditional curve. But, but when he was drafted, um, the curveball was kind of the supposed to be the carrying secondary, but, um, as Chad, the reason I just I little less down or a little more down on him than Chaz is or I'm down on him was just as he said the command I just don't see the command profile developing. Um, he was rushing his delivery as Chaz said he had a couple blocks, and you know it's I guess it could also be kind of jaded by the fact that I you know I've seen him so many times over the years. Prospect fatigue is a thing. Yeah, and he just <laughs> he's never missed bats for me. He's walked guys and just I'm just I, uh, I I'm. You know, I'm going to need to see him, you know, succeed over a pretty long period of time before I'm willing to make that, you know, uh, that judgment, that call as anything more than maybe an organizational reliever. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it up then. We're we're pushing it. We're coming up on an hour here. So let me uh, let's wrap up the Portland talk. And, you know, if you guys have any questions about anything you heard today from these guys or anything else they might have seen in Portland, it's podcast at SoxProspects.com. Um, we're going to get into some news, and, and as a lead into that, I have our other listener email that we got. Uh, this one is from Michael, and he says, Hey, guys, what do we have in Ben Taylor? His intro to the bigs has gone pretty well, and I think that that's frankly kind of an understatement. Taylor, as we all know at this point, surprise, made the uh, opening day roster in the bullpen and uh, pitched really well in Boston, uh, his numbers on the website are not up to date right now because they say he threw an inning into two-thirds in two games, and that doesn't include the 66 pitches he threw yesterday to kind of save the bullpen. But uh, Ben Taylor, Ian, is a guy we were on for a while. Um, The question is, what do we have in Ben Taylor? Um, Has the short stint in the majors changed what we think there is there, or is it you know just actualization of a potential? Yeah, no, I I mean, I I kind of seen him as a sixth, seventh inning guy since he was in Lowell and I still think that's what he is. Um, you know, nothing he, he showed changed it. Um, but he did show he can handle, you know, get major league hitters out. And that's kind of, you know, that's a good sign. That's promising, especially considering he jumped from straight from Portland last year and even started last year in Salem. So that's a pretty meteoric rise to go from starting last year in Salem to making the big league roster on opening day this year. I think he just hit the one year mark of being a relief pitcher. Come to think of it. Yeah, because he started a few games in Salem to start last year, too. Yeah. Or those – yeah, he did. So, yeah, that's true. Um, and, I, I mean, we, we kind of had him pegged as a reliever since he signed. And the big thing that we saw, and it was backed up by, the I think, the stat cast data, is that he just has a lot of life on his fastball. And I think he his spin rate was one of the highest um, in the of the Red Sox pitchers from the opening couple of games on the fastball. 
and, you know, hitters, he was missing bats with it. And that's very encouraging. You know, when you can get swing and misses against big league hitters with your fastball, that's as a reliever, that's going to be serving you very well. So that was a good sign. And, um, the secondary stuff, you know, the slider has a little has some potential. It's a little harder than what he used what he was throwing when he was in the low minors. Same with the changeup, but I just you know I, again I I'm not sure you know he he's not doesn't have a lot of upside, but he has the potential to be you know very serviceable big league arm, and he's shown he's big league ready. So I think he's someone we'll see a lot um, going up and down on the Pawtucket shuttle this year whenever Boston needs a reliever, and then he'll get sent back down like today when he kind of had to take one for the team after Stephen Wright struggled yesterday. And I think he threw three and two thirds innings or something, almost 80 pitches. I thought he threw 66 pitches or 66 pitches, but yeah. that was just, you know, Hey kid, you're going to go out there. You're going to take one for the team, save the bullpen. And then you're going to get optioned after the game. But if they need a reliever in a couple of weeks for something, I'm sure he'll be right back up. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good to see who would have thought that the seventh round senior sign out of South Alabama would be the second player from the, the Red Sox 2015 draft to make the majors. Uh, I would have thought it might have been, say, one of the college guys out of Washington, Missouri State, or Ohio State. But can't predict ball, man. Can't predict it. It's uh, good signing. Danny, Danny Watkins, great yeah, work there. Uh, yes. Who's the Red Sox, uh, one of the area scouts. Mm-hmm. That's why, I mean, I think we, we've talked about a lot in past podcasts just – that they did after that first initial year with the senior signs, they've done a much better job with who they've gotten with those picks. And um, we're starting to see the fruits. Yeah. We're starting to see the fruits of the labors with guys like um, Ben Taylor. Mm -hmm. Um, Other big news since the last episode, Jay groom went to the DL uh, and his first start, he came out in the second inning. He kind of had the same issue you, he had when you saw him for the first time in Lowly and where the control wasn't really there, just kind of got dinked and dunked, but then gave up a home run uh, to clear some bases, and then uh, I kind of got home, put the game on, and the first pitch I saw was a 45-foot, I don't know if it was a fastball or a curveball or what, it only went 45 feet, and trainer goes out to the mound and he came out of the game. Uh, officially, it's a lat strain. Anything to be worried about there? I mean, the injury until we know more. Um, mm-hmm. If it's just a yeah. lat strain, apparently he's going to miss two or three starts. Yeah, that, I mean, that's not that right big now. a deal. I, I don't really, I don't care how he did in one start. But it's just more about the injury. You know, hopefully it's not a big deal because it's his injuries are bad and he's also missing developmental time. So injuries are bad. Yep. You shouldn't get injured. Um, nope. Speaking of injuries, uh, the injury bug has hit the Salem Red Sox. Uh, they finally got Jose Sermo, who started the year on the DL back today. And uh, right now on the, their disabled list, they have outfielders Tate Mathedi and Kyrie Washington and third baseman Michael Chavis. Um, with Chavis, it's an elbow. I don't know what the injury is for either Matheny or Washington. But uh, Chavis, you wonder if it's the same elbow, elbow issue he was dealing with in spring training when we saw him, um, when he wasn't throwing at all. But uh, kind of rough for that squad to get the injury bug because they've had to get some reinforcements from uh, from extended spring training just to feel the team and, and you know some rough times there. But uh, you worried about anybody there, Ian? The, the elbow with Chavis has me a little bit... Uh, not concerned that would be too high, but not really. I mean, again, it's early in the season. Um, the Shavis one, because of the previous thing, as you alluded to, is a little bit, but we kind of have to take you know take them Grand for their assault. word that it's not too serious. And um, you know, if he's back in a couple weeks, it's well, just it's they not haven't that big said whether it's serious or not, as far as I know, unless I missed something. I thought I thought some someone maybe. maybe Alex Spear tweeted out that it wasn't considered serious. It was more precautionary, I think, okay. but it might have been yeah. someone else. But I, I thought was, I saw that. I was surprised he didn't start the season on the DL, frankly, just to get him a week, an extra week to kind of rest up, because um, sometimes yeah. you try and you know rush back from things, and that just makes it worse. But sorry, I was unmuted. Yeah, especially too when it's an arm injury. Um, you know, that's not something you really want to fool around with. And you know, if you're having any general soreness, it's usually good to take a step back. Yeah. But um, apparently, they thought he was ready at least, and it crept back up. So yeah, um, we'll the, see. The other injury that, not including the major league level, where Jackie Bradley uh, had the knee knee strain or sprain that they're going. I think they went with strain, right? Um, and everybody on the in the clubhouse having the flu. Um, the other injury that I thought was kind of noteworthy was Brian Bogus- Bogusevic, uh is on the DL at Pawtucket with, uh, I believe, a foot fracture. Um, I, bet I will double-check that. But um, right now they have three healthy outfielders because Alan Craig is not playing in the field a- at all. Um, yeah, right foot fracture is the, is the word for Bogusevic. The only healthy outfielders have been Bryce Brentsford, Snake Castillo, and Junior Lake. 
Uh, is there any reason for Nuri Tavares to be in Portland? Uh, Chaz, we haven't really heard from you in this segment. Uh, it, it seems crazy to me that Tavares is not in Pawtucket yet. Well, I think the only, I think the reason is that he's kind of he's kind of blocked. They have those other guys that are <laughs> in Pawtucket. I guess, but it, it's you 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 have room. I guess it depends on how bad the foot fracture is, but maybe they're just waiting for Selsky to come back down. I I don't know. I I'm still very confused. Uh, frankly. I think it, it's strange to me because he's 25. You know, it's not like he's a 22 right. year old or a 23 year old. He's 25, and he spent all of last year in Portland, and even finished last year in Pawtucket. He, had, you know, he had 335 in Portland last year. I feel like that 335, 385, 506 in Portland. That's you got to test that guy at the next level. So yeah, I, I'm Meanwhile, a little surprised. Junior Lake has hit absolutely nothing so far, um, and I mean, granted, he's he's a guy with major league experience, but. Um, he's not like he's playing center field either. Uh, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a little bit surprising because um, especially, too, as we talked about, they have enough outfield options in Portland. So uh, it, maybe it is the Selsky thing, as you alluded to, that when Rutledge comes off the DL, they're going to send Selsky down. But with Bradley out, who's the backup outfield? That then, also so. doesn't make any sense to me either because you would think when, well, Rutledge, well, Jackie Bradley comes off the DL, you send Hernandez down, I guess. Um, but then when Rutledge comes off the deal, you, put, you send Selsky down. But is that even close? I haven't heard. I haven't seen anything about that. I don't know. I, so, I, I have no idea. So I don't know. It's it's strange. All right. Um, any anything else new and noteworthy, gentlemen? I think that that's it on the injury front, the transaction front. Uh, not a whole lot happening otherwise. Josh Ockamy is off to a great start statistically uh, in in Salem. He's been one of the hottest hitters in the system, and I'm stalling as I try and pull up. The Travis Lakins reports are much better. Yes. Um, well, he's thrown really well over his first two starts. I was just going to bring up the numbers. I think he has like... Well, I've got Occamy's up, so let's go with Occamy first. Yeah. In seven games, he's hitting 444, 500, 667, 12 hits and 27 at-bats. Only one home run so far, and I think that was in his first or second, like a second or third at-bat uh, of the season. He went deep. Four walks, seven Ks in seven games, though. Yeah, I, I think I would say that the, the thing that's interesting to me... Um, is that the starting pitching prospects, the few that there are, have all, for the most part, other than Groom, yeah. gotten off to pretty good starts. Like Travis Lakin's 11 innings, 17 strikeouts, one walk, and only given up nine hits, is, one run, one earned run. Is so that he's, good? And, and the reports, what we're hearing, the velocity's back, the curveball is working. So that's definitely encouraging. I know he's someone that Chaz really liked when we saw him back in spring training last year. And now knowing that he was injured for most of last year, it kind of makes sense why the reports weren't good. And then um, Darwin's and Hernandez, another guy that Chaz and I both like, has 15 strikeouts and three walks and nine innings. And the big question with him is he's going to throw enough strikes and thus far it is. And uh, Sean Anderson, um, who we alluded to earlier about Matt's piece, who was pretty was awful last year in his two outings with Lowell um, in 10 innings or 10.2 innings, has 13 strikeouts, two walks, and it was allowed eight hits and one earned run. So that's very encouraging and kind of it looks like he's building off the progress. Um he made when we saw him in spring training where his stuff looked a lot crisper and just, he looked a lot more comfortable um, out on the mound. Yeah. I, I, I think you could see after about a month, uh, a chain promotion and movement that, you know, you kind of get maybe beaks to the bullpen, Lakin's up to Portland, uh, you know, and Anderson or Mike Schwarin, although it certainly looks like it would be Anderson at this point up to Salem. Uh, there could be some movement there pretty early, although I think, you know, Vlakens, if he keeps pitching like this, will be in Portland at the end of this month, never mind end of May. Yeah, I said I said on Twitter yesterday or two days ago that I think Lakens at the latest will be up in Portland by Memorial Day. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And then, yeah, and it was, you talked about Schwarren. He actually showed tonight. It was five innings, one hit, eight strikeouts tonight for him, which was good because I think he got bombed in his first outing. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It, the, the Greenville team has some, even without Groom, uh, or other than Groom, the pitching staff has been pretty impressive. So that's, you know, that's good because, as we said, they just they have no starting pitching prospects. So anyone who might be even, you know, you can squint and see one, it's encouraging that they've gotten off the strong starts for the most part, other than, I guess, Reniel Raudes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and Raudes, you know, it's two starts. We'll see. We, we talked we about him last time, too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, we should just at least mention the the numbers from the his starts. It, it, well, I guess he just has had the one start so far. So there you go. Yeah, it's it's uh, one in eight, one outing. He went four innings, gave up five runs on six hits, walked two, uh, gave up two home runs, only struck out three. 
but again, it's one start. I'm not panicking yet myself. Um, nope. All right. Well, you know what? Let's put a bow, let's put a bow on this one. Thank you, everyone, for the download. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to Joe Tetralt, our podcast producer. Uh, thank you to Chaz and to Ian for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you to them for putting up with me uh, completely spacing on my schedule for the evening and hopping on at the very last minute as they sat there waiting, uh, like the diva that I am. So for these two, I'm Chris. Uh, The cat is over there sleeping, so she can't say goodbye. Uh, Thank you all for listening, and we'll be back at you soon. These guys, I guess, are going to Portland next. So uh, maybe we'll have some... Pawtucket. Pawtucket is what I meant. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, So maybe we'll get some updates from Pawtucket. Uh, Lots to talk about there as well. So thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back at you soon.